Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we concluded our look at the fascinating reign of Ose Kwajo by discussing the outbreak of an international crisis between the Fonti and Ashanti in the form of a hostage crisis. In the end, the Ashanti won out, obtaining the release of their hostages while annexing the Achem kingdom and securing a new ally in the form of the Ga city of Accra, though failing to defeat the Fonti and their Wasa allies in battle. Shortly thereafter, Ose Kwajo, the first elected Ashantahene, successful reformer king, and the overseer of the first prolonged period of Ashanti stability in decades, passed away in 1777. This episode, we follow maybe the most political drama-esque events we've seen in this show so far. One crafty noblewoman will maneuver her way into becoming the most powerful individual in the Ashanti Empire, but not without overcoming some serious challenges and facing major opposition from her enemies. Season 3, Episode 11, Queen Mother Konado. In the city of Mampong, the northernmost major Ashanti city, a very important marriage was about to take place. Some of the most crucial moments in history happen without anybody alive understanding the significance of events. Sure, with the power of hindsight, historians love to proclaim turning points. This or that is the moment when history changed forever, but rarely do the people actually present understand the gravity of an important event. But this wedding in Mampong in 1767 was an exception. Everybody present knew the exact significance of what they were witnessing. The king of Mampong, a teenage boy named Safo Kantaka, and his family approached the door of a large, luxurious house in Kumasi. They knocked on the house's door, and when the family inside opened, they showered them with a monsoon of invaluable gifts. Palm wine, cowrie shells, cola nuts, and, of course, numerous items encrusted with gold. This was the tradition of a wealthy Akan wedding, and by accepting these gifts, the family inside was showing consent for their daughter to marry the Mamponghene. The families parted ways and began plotting the finer details of their children's wedding. Once the wedding began, everything went smoothly, and soon enough, the bride and groom were married. This wedding is so important because of who the bride was. Her name was Kanado Yadom, an intelligent, young, and beautiful woman. But the importance of Kanado's wedding was derived not from her beauty or intelligence, but from her familial connections. See, Kanado's family came from a minor noble branch of the Oyoko tribe, the same tribe from which the royal dynasty of the Ashanti descends. The kings of Mampong, on the other hand, were from the Brechul, another important Akan tribe. The marriage of a Mampong Hene to a woman of the Oyoko tribe, much less a noble Oyoko family, was unprecedented. As a result of the marriage, Konodo became the first Oyoko queen of Mampong, as well as the bridge that linked the two most powerful tribes in the Ashanti Empire. However, this was just the beginning for Konodo. Her husband, the young Mampong Hene, died at an early age, though they did manage to conceive a daughter before his demise. Now, the very prestigious Konado became the object of affection for many ambitious Ashanti politicians. After all, wealthy, connected, and good-looking women tend to attract the interest of men in any place or time. Soon, many of the most important and powerful men throughout the Ashanti Empire, including among their ranks merchants, bureaucrats, governors, sought to position themselves as Konado's new husband. However, she turned all of her ambitious suitors down. Konado, it seemed, had her own ambitions that the countryside of the empire simply couldn't fulfill. And like many ambitious youngsters throughout history, Konodo's goals required her to move to the big city, in this case, Kumasi. A few years after returning to Kumasi and settling into a new home, Konodo became acquainted with a royal bureaucrat named Adum Chum. Adum Chum worked as a specific type of Ansafohene, called an Ochiame, basically meaning royal linguist. The job of the Ochiame is something that we sort of take for granted today in our modern media landscape. His job was to make announcements to the public. You see, in the Ashanti Kingdom, there was no mass media to notify people about upcoming festivals, political events, wars, crimes, or anything else we associate with the media today. Additionally, the Ashanti didn't exactly have a great system of writing. You see, the Akan throughout Ghana used a system of pictographic symbols called Adinkra to communicate ideas. There were a few hundred adinkra, and as a pictographic writing system, each individual character represented a different concept. Some were quite straightforward. Our podcast cover for the season shows the adinkra symbol for the Golden Stool, which stands for the Ashanti government more generally. However, others are more esoteric. One well-known adinkra symbol, the Sankofa, depicts a bird reaching its neck onto its back to reach a seed. It represents the concept of the value of learning from the past. However, the limited number of universally accepted symbols, and the lack of a proper grammar syntax, 
made it basically impossible to write anything longer than a few words in Adinkra at a time. And this is where the royal linguist comes in. He would move from town to town, with a piece of cloth with Adinkra symbols stamped on it. He would then use these symbols as a type of bullet point list, filling in the blanks with his own knowledge of events. For example, a royal linguist could take a piece of cloth with the symbols for the Ashanti king, the symbol for war, the symbol of the Fonti, and a symbol for bravery. He could then use these symbols to give a long, detailed speech about how the Ashantihane had declared war on the Fonti and that they needed to be brave for the upcoming fight. If you want to learn more about the Akan system of pictographic writing, then you can listen to our premium episode about Adinkra by supporting the show on patreon.com slash historyofafrica. Anyways, Adam Trum's position as the royal linguist was important, because they were among the most respected members of the Insafohane bureaucracy. After all, dispersing government information to the population is a very important job. Upon meeting Adam Trum, Konadu immediately took a liking to him. Soon after their meeting, the two were slated for marriage. Now, whether this was cynically planned by Konadu or whether it was just coincidence, her marriage to Trum would prove to be a major boon to her status. Not only was Trum an important and respected bureaucrat, he was also a member of the royal family, the maternal cousin of the Ashantihane at the time, Osekwajo. So, by marrying Trum, Konado had inserted herself into the royal family of the Ashanti Empire, as well as the family of the Mamponghene, and not to mention her own noble background. Much like the Jeffersons, Konado was definitely moving on up. But even then, Konado's luck when it came to social advancement simply couldn't stop coming. In 1770, just a couple months after a new marriage to Chum, the old Ashanti Hema, the Ashanti queen mother, passed away. Now, in most societies, being the mother of the king is a, an ultimately powerless position. But among the Ashanti, this couldn't be further from the truth. The Ashanti Hema was the most powerful position that an Ashanti woman could obtain in government, and was a fairly important position in general. The Ashantihama attended all Kotoko meetings as a full voting member, though most of the Ashantihama's power was informal, largely stemming from her status as the single closest and most trusted advisor to the king. Traditionally, she also held the considerable position of being the keeper of royal inheritance. That is, her son would become the next Ashantihane, as per the Ashanti's matrilineal inheritance system. Typically, the position of queen mother was kept in the family, with the king's sister almost always being slated as the mother of the next king. However, with some significant lobbying by her husband, the royal family of Mampong, and her own relatives, Osei was convinced to appoint Konadu as the new Ashantihema. Besides, he had already reformed or changed enough Ashanti governing institutions, what did it matter that he was changing one more? And, just like that, through a combination of luck and skillful manipulation of royal dynasties, Konado had elevated herself from the daughter of a mid-tier noble to the single highest position attainable by a woman in the Ashanti Empire. She would serve as the queen mother under Osei for about seven years, and this time of her life is mostly unmentioned in Ashanti official histories besides the fact that she gave birth to a few sons, implying that she would keep her head low and did little to upset anyone in power. Now, you might be thinking, this is interesting and all, Andy, but why does it matter? What does all this dynastic politicking and this random woman have to do with the greater course of the Ashanti Empire's history? Well, a lot, actually. Because Konado, despite having reached the official limit for the powers that a woman could obtain in the Ashanti Empire, was not done advancing. And in her ambitions, Konado was about to spark the largest scandal in Ashanti history since at least the impeachment of Obadom. As mentioned earlier, her seven years as the queen mother of the empire was inoffensive and quiet. However, everything changed in 1777 with the death of Ose Quadro. As we've noted numerous times now, succession crises are anything but uncommon in Ashanti history. So far in Ashanti history, there has been exactly zero transitions of power that went smoothly and as intended. Of the four Ashanti kings so far, three have come to power through violent rebellion, and one, Ose Kwajo, came to power through relatively peaceful rebellion. So, at this point, I'm probably going to start sounding like a broken record when I say that Ose Kwajo's death was not followed by a time of tranquil political satisfaction. But, well, it wasn't. But, uniquely, the squabble for power that followed Kwajo's death involved an election. After all, Kwajo's ascent to the throne had set the precedent that the rise of the new king had to be done with the approval of voting parties that being the Kotoko members, Nsafohene, and Amanhene. While Kwajo's election to power had taken the form of a wider, more popular assembly, that was an impromptu, heat-of-the-moment deal, and nobody in the Kumasi government had ever planned for the average Ashanti dude to have a say in who was the next Ashantihene. 
So, when the news came that Osei Kwajo had passed on, tradition states that, at least temporarily, power fell to the Mamponghene. So, almost immediately, the provisional monarch sent out messengers to convene a new assembly that would elect the new Ashantahene. Osei Kwajo and his advisors, years ago, had decided on this system of elections, seemingly to try to avoid the divisive nature of choosing a new king of the Ashanti. But, as the council convened, it became very clear how divisive this decision had remained. And that makes sense, after all. Calling a bunch of nobles, bureaucrats, and governors together, each with their own personal agendas and interests, to choose who will be the leader of their country for the rest of their lifetimes, maybe, is, well, bound to create some friction. At the meeting, it had become clear that, before his death, Quadro had placed his finger on the scale a bit. The favorite that Quadro had selected to succeed him was an infant boy, Konadu's son of Poku Kwame. Yes, Kwajo had violated, reformed, transformed, or done away with entirely many Ashanti civic traditions, but there was one that he was not willing to touch during his time in power. The Queen Mother's son would become the next king, and since Konado was Queen Mother, it was her son who would rule. However, Osei Kwajo was far from the only important Ashanti elite who had sought to influence the outcome of this election. The name of one of these elites was Osei Kwame. And yes, there are two people, each named Kwame, on both sides of this power struggle. And that made researching this episode quite painful. Anyways, I'm going to call them Kwame, for Ose Kwame, and Opoku, for Opoku Kwame, Kanadu's son, appropriately. Yes, repeated names can get pretty disorienting. Anyways, as if this wasn't confusing enough, Kwame wasn't completely unrelated to Konadu in the familial sense. Kwame was actually the child of Konadu's former husband, the Mamponghene, though he was born by another of the king's wives. Which is where I should mention, polygamy was a rare but accepted practice among the Akan. However, Ose Kwame didn't have much interaction with his family. His father had passed away when he was only a year old, so he was raised from infancy by a series of nurses and nannies. Mampong, uniquely among the central cities of the Ashanti Empire, had a small but visible Muslim minority, cultivated by his father's mercantile connection to the Muslim Dagomba and Gonja in the north. The young Kwame, due to his parents being very wealthy, very busy, and in his father's case, very dead, was basically raised by his servants. Most of these servants were Muslim. The fact that he grew up around these Muslim nannies and butlers, rather than Ashanti court life, would deeply influence the boy. He developed not only a deep sympathy for the Islamic faith and its beliefs, but also an unusual comfort around the non-noble classes of the empire. He would never officially convert to Islam, but his actions later in his life are very revealing that he held a deep-seated solidarity and sympathy for the Muslim community in the Ashanti provinces, leading some to believe that he may have been a practicing Muslim in secret. After Osei Kwajo's death, Kwame also committed to making a play to enthrone himself on the Golden Stool. Or, well, that's probably not true. His advisors made a play to enthrone Kwame. Did I mention Kwame was 12? Yeah, he was 12 at the time. So maybe it's best to remember that Kwame himself was probably not super concerned with all the political machinations going on around him, and more concerned about the question of whether or not girls really had cooties. So, who were these advisors who were pushing for Kwame's enthronement? Well, one of Kwame's most important allies was a man named Yamua Ponko. Ponko, a middle-aged man, was one of the archetypical beneficiaries of Osei Kwajo's meritocratic government, with Osei Kwajo's reforms of the Ashanti government to make it more meritocratic, and an encapsulation of the Ashanti's growing bourgeoisie class. Today, people mostly use the term bourgeoisie to refer more generally to the wealthiest members of society as a whole, but historically the term referred to a very specific class of people. That is, the bourgeoisie were people who had a lot of wealth, but lacked formal noble privileges. Ponko had no noble ancestry, and no familial connections to power. In fact, he wasn't even ethnically Ashanti, but originally descended from a Danchira family. Ponko was a merchant who had grown rich from his participation in the trade of agricultural products like cola nuts and slaves. Due to his financial success, Ponko had even managed to kind of insert himself into the noble system, using his fortunes to pay off the debts of a small town in exchange for them recognizing him as an Amanhene. By 1777, Ponko had become one of the wealthiest men in the Ashanti Empire, but he lacked formal political connections. Yes, he was now officially an Amanhene after buying off that small town, but to many of the elites in the Ashanti court, Ponko was still just a rich commoner in over his head. So Ponko sought to make connections, namely connections to a new Ashantahene. 
Kwame was the perfect candidate. Someone who he could support onto the stool and make an ally of for life. Perhaps even more importantly, Kwame's support among the Empire's Muslim subjects was a big deal as well. Ponka was a merchant after all, and ensuring that the northern trade route through the Ashanti's Muslim subjects stayed open was in his economic interests. I mean, if these states went into rebellion to support Kwame, and Ponko was on the other side of that conflict, what would that mean for his northern business connections? While Ponko was the most prominent, many other members of the emerging and growing Ashanti bourgeoisie class set their support behind Osei Kwame as the next Ashantihane. As mentioned earlier, Kwame also received support from the empire's Muslim subjects, including the kingdoms of Dagomba in the far north and Gonja. At the very tail end of Osei Kwajo's rule, these states had been forced back into a position of submission to the Ashantis. However, perhaps if they could support a ruler like Kwame, whose Muslim sympathies were an open secret, the kings of these subject states could ensure relatively relaxed tribute payments and levies from their Ashanti overlords in the future. Rounding out Osei Kwame's base of support were some factions within the nobility of Mampong. The nobility of Mampong were put into a tricky position in the debate of who should rule. After all, both Osei Kwame and Konado were members of Mampong's royal lineage, one through birth and the other through marriage. So the result was a family feud, with the Mampong nobility being split approximately 50-50 on who they would support. Konado, for her part, was supported by a coalition composed of basically everyone else, namely much of the Ashanti's old guard of noble elites. At the council meeting, Osei Kwame's allies proved incredibly persuasive. Whether through bribes, rhetoric, shared interest, or a combination of all three, they somehow managed to convince most of the assembly to cast their vote behind the dark horse candidate, Kwame. In a shocking turn of events, Osei Kwame, someone completely outside of the lineage of Osei Tutu's dynasty that had ruled the Ashanti throughout their entire history, had been elected as the new Ashantihene. However, if Kwame's allies thought that winning the election guaranteed a safe and stable rule for their 12-year-old Patsy, they had sorely miscalculated. Outraged at what she saw as a farcical election, and resentful that she had missed the opportunity to place her son on the throne, Konado reached out to one of her closest allies. From her seven years as a member of the Kotoko Council, Konado had silently been gathering connections, and one of the most important was a man named Atakora, the Minister of War. On Konado's request, Atakora organized an army and marched on Kumasi. Konado's young son Opoku was crowned as the new Ashantihane in 1778, while Ponko and Kwame were forced to flee the city. With victory seemingly assured, Konado and Atakora disbanded their army and settled in to begin a peaceful rule. That same year, Konado's second husband passed away, leaving her in an open position to acquire a new ally through strategic marriage. Unlike her previous weddings, where she had been significantly younger than her husband, in 1778, Konado offered a diplomatic wedding to a man of roughly the same age as her. This was the son of the old Ashantihene, Ose Kwajo, meaning that, by marriage, he was technically her cousin once removed, very narrowly avoiding the Ashanti taboo of incest. Now, Konado's new husband isn't super important, but it's worth bringing him up because he was a fairly important landowner, ruling as the Amanhene of a town in the southeast of Ghana. So, it goes to show you that even with her son securely on the throne, Konado continued to expand her power through political connections. However, Konado and her son were not really all that secure on the stool. Yes, she and Atakora had technically emerged from this kingly election debacle victorious, but the means through which they had achieved this victory had not exactly made them many friends. I mean, say what you will about the proceedings of the council, but at the end of the day, the assembly had made their choice, and the majority of the Ashanti government had elected Kwame as the new Ashantihene. Imagine how the Amanhene and Ensafohene must have felt when the Queen Mother, someone who, mind you, was an upstart who shouldn't have even been the Queen Mother to begin with, had overruled the entire thing with basically a military coup. Sorry, fellow Ashanti elites, but this whole electing of kings things we established about a decade ago, well, that's only the case when my son gets to be the new king. I don't know about you, but in their shoes, I wouldn't be very happy either. And happy, they weren't. To make matters worse, this unhappiness was further egged on by who else but Ponko. Yes, Ponko had fled Kumasi, but he had no intention of rolling over and allowing Konado to claim victory. Soon, he and many other of the upstart and upset elites in the Ashanti territories began conspiring to overthrow the Queen Mother and her infant Ashantihene. 
This brewing conspiracy found aid from the Empire's northern vassals. The kings of Dagbon and Gonja joined the growing conspiracy against Konadol, supplying men and arms to the brewing rebellion. After two years of patient planning, the conspirators assembled a makeshift army and marched on Kumasi. Konadol and Atakora had not seen the attack coming and were completely unprepared. They knew that they couldn't defeat the coming onslaught. They fled to Mampong in the hopes that Konado's dynastic connection to the city's rulers would result in her receiving refuge. The current Mampong Hene was her nephew, after all. By 1780, Ose Kwame and his supporters had consolidated their control over the rest of the Ashanti Empire, while Konado and her allies prepared a defense in Mampong, desperately planning on how to turn their situation around. This opportunity for a political comeback for Konado wouldn't arrive. The next year, Ponko himself led an army to march on Mampong. After defeating the outnumbered and undersupplied army defending the city, Ponko and Osekwame had crushed the last of their opposition. Many of Konodo's allies were executed, while the Queen Mother herself was taken back to Kumasi as a prisoner. Ponko and his young ally, the now 15-year-old Osekwame, were now firmly in charge. However, as we just learned, being in the seat of power does not necessarily mean smooth sailing. While his spot on the throne was now uncontested, Ose Kwame was far from finished with controversy, as his reign would prove to be one of the most contentious and downright unusual reigns in Ashanti history. Join us next week, as Ose Kwame finally gets a chance to rule in his own right. And, let's just say, it ends with Konodo back in power. And, spoiler alert, see how Konodo avenges her defeat and takes power back into her own hands. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Morgan Blackmore, Sean Burke, Sarah Mpenza, and Tobias Tungland, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really means a lot.